All right. Uh, I'm very pleased to uh, have today Laura Cha, who is connected to us electronically, live from Hong Kong. It's 9 p.m. in Hong Kong. Uh, and uh, I, I think, well, uh, we've already talked about Laura. She's one of the most uh, distinguished executives in Asia. Uh, she is on the Executive Council of Hong Kong. She's a director at HSBC. Uh, she has served in the China Securities Regulatory Commission and recently uh, at the uh, National People's Congress of China, which is a uh, uh, remarkable uh, set of achievements for someone, uh, for any one person. And uh, I understand that the, f the, the first uh, Hong Kong uh, citizen to serve in the government of, of the People's Republic. Uh, uh, but the, I guess the, the, the really big thing that uh, uh, comes to my mind is that HSBC is one of the most important and biggest banks in the world. And I looked up and I find that there are five branch offices of HSBC within uh, a few miles of right here. Yes. Uh, anyway, I'll, uh, Laura, uh, looking at you there. Uh, yes. You, why don't uh, you you could introduce, uh, give us a, a talk about what you do and what your thoughts are about the financial situation are, uh, and then we will turn it over to uh, to questions. Okay. Uh, first of all, good morning to you all. Uh, thank you, Bob, for inviting me here uh, via electronically. It is my honor to have the opportunity to um, talk to you. Uh, when I was invited to give this uh, talk, I um, went on the internet and see that uh, your course syllabus is uh, very comprehensive. And uh, I would imagine that at the end of the course, you would have covered or will cover just about every aspect of the um, financial markets. And you will have a good idea of the function of the markets and um, how it works. What I want to do in the next 20 minutes or so is really to give you um, an overview of what it is like to work in the financial market, to, uh, to have a job in the financial market, and perhaps eventually you may want to have a career in, the financial, uh, in financial services. Um, and then, you know, I, after that, I will be happy to answer any questions that uh, Bob, you, or any one of you want to uh, raise with me. Um, I think when one talks about the, um, a career or a job in the financial services, one tends to think about the private sector, uh, the banks, the investment banks, um, the fund management companies, uh, and, of course, the... Um, uh, the trading, the traders, you know, both in terms of stocks, futures, options. Uh, of course, in the last decade, hedge funds, private equity. Um, there's no question that the private sector is very exciting. There's no question that a job or a career in financial services in the private sector is, by the most of, um, by the most of any standard, is very financially rewarding. But what I really want to talk, talk to you about is the other side of the financial market, which is the public sector side. And uh, I want to share with you my own experience in the public sector. Uh, when we talk about financial services, as I mentioned, we talk about the banks, the intermediaries, what we call the intermediaries, the practitioners, people who practice in the financial market. You know, if you are a college graduate, typically if you go to one of these firms, you start out as a, a research assistant. You do research. Um, if you are in a bank, you will learn to read um, how to interpret balance sheets, how to decide what, uh, you know, when people come to you for loans, uh, how you evaluate them, and what are the credit uh, worthiness of the potential client, whether you should or should not lend money. If you go to work for a private equity firm, you do the same kind of research, except that it's for companies. You know, you will help the firm decide whether uh, a particular transaction is uh, worthy to, um, to take on. And uh, in between, of course, there are all kind of financial um, 
uh, uh, mechanisms or tools, uh, products, as one would say, that you devise, that the market devise, and to facilitate these financial services. And those have been covered in your course, I can see that. Um, but the other, the, as I mentioned, the other side of the financial service, the other side of the financial market is really the regulators, the public sector side, the policy makers, um, the standard setters, uh, bodies such as the uh, Financial Accounting Standard uh, Board. And all these are the other part of the equation which help to make the financial market function well. And it is important for the public sector uh, to have equally bright students. Uh, I think uh, some of us get a little worried in the last decade, a lot of the bright students who want to go into financial services or go into the private sector. The public sector is important because the regulators and policy setters help ensure that the market function in an orderly fashion. Um, we want to make clear as regulators and policy setters, we want to make sure that the market not only function properly, uh, that, the, that the playing field is level, that the rules are clear, um, and so that financial service and finance can indeed uh, perform its function in society. And that's where, you know, when we have in the US, when we have the SEC, the CFTC, the Fed, um, and of course the exchanges, and not to mention the Department of Justice, the State Attorney General's Office, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What the public sector do is really to make sure that people on the private sector, in the fund, in the banks, and the investment bank, the fund manager, and so on, they behave properly, so that the investors are treated fairly and equally, so that everyone is entitled or are given the same kind of information. Um, so that no one particular group is, um, uh, has an advantage over the other group. And that's where investor protection comes in, corporate governance comes in. And I myself, my career has largely been in the public sector side. Um, although I started out as a lawyer, uh, I was trained as a lawyer and I practiced as a lawyer for um, seven, eight years. Uh, in the foreign direct investment into China in the 80s. And I dealt with a lot of multinationals and um, in the corporate side, in the finance side. Uh, my foray into the public sector as a regulator was really, it came out of the blue. I was headhunted uh, to join the newly found um, Securities and Futures Commission in Hong Kong, that was 1990. And uh, I thought I will do it for a couple years, uh, learn uh, to broaden my horizon and see what it is like to be in the public sector. And uh, I enjoyed what I did, and then I stayed 10 years. And then I was uh, making an offer by the central government, and I went, went to work for the Chinese regulator uh, for almost four years and, and became the first person outside of mainland China to join the Chinese government. Um, so I had a total 14 years of experience as a regulator. And I have to say that it has been hugely gratifying because as a regulator uh, and a policy setter, I was able to facilitate the development of markets in Hong Kong. Um, in the early days, Hong Kong was a, uh, in the early days, I mean in the, in the 70s and the 80s, Hong Kong was a largely local market. Um, the international players like Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, they came and went, they took a look and decided the Hong Kong market was too small for them. All that took a change uh, in 1992 when the Chinese government decided that they want to use the Hong Kong market uh, as a way to, um, uh, to help transform or reform the state-owned enterprises. And by that time, I was already at, uh, at the Securities and Futures Commission in Hong Kong. And because of my experience uh, working in the Chinese market in the 80s, I became the only person who was familiar enough with the Chinese market to 
take on that responsibility of really designing a structure for state-owned enterprises in China to become listed companies in Hong Kong. And uh, it was groundbreaking work. Um, at the time, we knew that it was very important. We didn't know how important it would, have be it would become later on. Um, some 20 years later, Hong Kong market now is a totally international market. All the big, big players are here, and um, all the uh, uh, our half of more than half of our market capitalization came from Chinese uh, enterprises. Uh, more than half of the turnover on our stock exchange are from Chinese related companies, a Chinese company directly, or what we call red chips. So the coming of the Chinese uh, enterprises to Hong Kong really transformed not only the state-owned enterprises in China, but also the nature and stature of the Hong Kong market. I think today, most people will recognize that Hong Kong is an important financial center. And I would say that without the Chinese enterprises, we would still have been a very local market because our economy itself, Hong Kong's economy, has not been that big. It really is what had happened in China that had propelled our change. And as a regulator, I was fortunate to have that opportunity and to help structure the market and spearhead changes. The other thing that I did at the, as a regulator in Hong Kong was um, in the um, in the late 90s, 98, 99, uh, and 2000, um, there was a wave of demutualization of stock exchanges throughout the world. And I helped demutualize the stock and futures exchange in Hong Kong, merged them together, together with our clearing house. And we became, the stock exchange of Hong Kong became a listed company. Today, it is the largest, it is an exchange, it has the largest market cap, market cap in the world more than New York Stock Exchange and uh, London Stock Exchange. Um, and when I went to China, the market was in the nascent state. Uh, it, you know, bearing in mind that it was a socialist, communist socialist country, capitalism was a new thing, and stock market was an even newer thing in 1991. Uh, so I kind of witnessed, and then later on was fortunate enough when I went to work in the Chinese government, to participate in that growth of the Chinese market. And what I did in my almost four years as a Chinese regulator was to promote corporate governance. Uh, I introduced quarterly reporting, uh, the requirement of independent non-executive directors, and uh, it was exciting times. What I want to say really is, is the public sector work that would um, at least for me, I felt that I was making a difference. I was able to um, help the market change. And um, if things were not right, I, f I felt that I had um, the ability to, be, to, to make things right, to make things correct. Not always successful, I have to say. But what I want to really impress upon you or is that while the Private sector work in the financial services is extremely uh, financially rewarding. In the public sector, it's less so, but on a different level, I think um, the policymakers do perform a social good. And um, the good thing about the United States is there is a lot of interchange between the public and private sectors. People do move from the private sector to the public sector and back again. I think that's what makes um, the U.S. market vibrant, among other things. And uh, I think it is a, a tradition that many other countries and jurisdictions want to emulate, namely the people who have been in the private sector, uh, who has the experience, who have market experience, are needed in the public sector. In other words, you cannot have regulators who have very little knowledge of how the market works. At the same time, those people who have been in the public sector uh, have kind of instilled uh, on them the, the discipline of um, an orderly market, 
uh, doing the right thing for the market. And that, you know, when you have it transplanted or bringing being brought back into the private sector, it is also a good thing for the and healthy for the market as well. The other thing that I want to really talk about, um, other than the public sector work and as a career choice or as a job choice uh, in the financial services, is really the um, the global globalized nature of the markets these days. I think in my days uh, when I was going to college and law school in the United States, um, the U.S. was, and I don't mean by saying that it is no longer, but it is still everybody looked to the U.S. Uh, to be the center of uh, of the uh, of the uh, particularly in financial services. Everything happens in the U.S. and to a large extent it still does. But I think the world outside the U.S has undergone a lot of changes. A globalized market means that today, um, young people will find equally interesting and exciting work opportunity in financial services outside of the United States. I think um, in my days, in the 80s, certainly people, when they say they, if they want to work outside the US, it would be in the mature market like um, Europe, um, the UK, or Japan. I think increasingly more so in the last decade, uh, opportunities in Asia and in Latin America in financial services have become very um, exciting uh, for young graduates anywhere. And I would say if you are equipped as a young um, graduate and you want a career in financial services, I think you should not uh, rule out the possibility of working in a foreign country. Uh, in the emerging market in particular. I think in an emerging market, you will uh, learn in a way faster because you would be given more opportunities, more responsibility at an early age, and you, your learning curve will be steeper. Uh, and uh, it is also uh, interesting as well as frustrating, I have to say, um, uh, working in a developing market. There are things that you think that you can do, and then there are things that uh, it is not as the rules are not as clear, and the uh, environment and and the people around you are not as sophisticated or uh, educated as you are. But I think in today's world, uh, the globalized market means that the opportunities are everywhere, and I think particularly the emerging markets uh, will offer a lot of opportunities. Uh, Bob, I don't know whether this is enough as an introduction for you know for for us to carry on discussion or how how do you uh, feel about that? Yes, very good. I'll I'll turn and face the class. I can't see you very well, but uh, I thought it was very interesting hearing your uh, comments. Uh, what particularly struck me was your emphasis on the public sector and about regulators. Uh, and it reminds me, I, I visited the SEC once recently in the US. I had lunch with people there in Washington. And I found that a lot of them had worked in the private sector uh, in the past. And I, I was starting to wonder, you know, they must have taken a big pay cut. Why are you here at the SEC? And then I, it crossed my mind, well, maybe they're losers. You know, maybe they didn't make it in Wall Street. They can't. But when I talked with them, I got a different idea. That, Maybe they're here because they find all aspects of finance exciting. And uh, maybe the purpose of life isn't to make a huge amount of money. So I wonder if, if you agree with my assessment. I mean, why do people work in the public sector anyway if pay is lower? And that's a very mm -hmm. open and big question. Maybe you right. have a response yeah. to that. Uh, I think. Um uh, there are a couple of uh, reasons for that. I think one, um, that a, a career in public sector need not be permanent. You can work in a public sector for a number of years and then go out into the private sector. And your public sector experience is hugely um, marketable, if we could use that term. Uh, I know that particularly in the US, you know, if you had experience with the CFTC and the SEC or the Fed, 
you are very, I mean, provided that you're not really just in the technical aspect and you are in a broad policy aspect, I think you have a very marketable skill that people in the private sector don't necessarily have. Um, if you change job in the private sector, one bank and another, one private equity and another, and another hedge fund, they will be more or less the same. But I think in the public sector, that's where the difference is. That's one. The practical aspect is, of course, um, it is more steady work. Uh, in the, um, the financial, how should I say? Yes, the financial reward is huge in the private sector. But also, you know, it is subject to a cyclical, you know, when the market is down, there are massive layoff. Uh, and in the public sector is a little more steady. So it's, it's a different, I think it's, it could be a different phase in one's career. At certain phase, you might want to have a more steady uh, or you want to accumulate enough experience before you go out into the private sector or vice versa. And I have seen, you know, among our friends, some, uh, among the regulators, some people felt that they have made enough money. I mean, enough is a relative term. They make enough in the private sector, and they want to go in the public sector for a few years. Uh, I think that's uh, also one of the reasons. Yeah, it, uh, listening to what you said, it seems to me, in some sense, working in the public sector is an opportunity but also maybe a mission. When I'm thinking of what you've helped achieve for China, um, I think it's a really important mission in that you are getting the financial markets <coughs> working right. And the things you talked about, like independent directors on Chinese companies, is a way at combating the problem of corruption. You didn't use the word corruption. Or maybe that's too strong a word, but where things aren't up and up. And I thought that part of the motivation that maybe I'm sure you have, I mean, maybe you can confirm this, is just a sense of being part of history and part of making right. things right? Is yes. I, I think absolutely. Um, when I joined the, uh, when I became a regulator, I thought it was just going to be two, three years. I was going to broaden my horizon and it would help my, uh, uh, my career in the law. And then uh, just one thing led to the other and I find that it was extremely how should I say, it was very gratifying for me to be in a position where I feel that I was really participating in the development of a market. Uh, I'm sure colleagues in the SEC and CFTC feel the same way in a different manner because obviously the US market is at a different stage. Uh, and even among the regulators, there are the people who are in the enforcement uh, where they try to catch the bad guys, you know, or the insider dealing cases that we see nowadays. Those are under enforcement and, of course, the, uh, the Department of Justice, the State Attorney General's Office. Those people also, I feel, that have a um, feel that there is a mission. Uh, I think that's also a, a very important aspect of financial market. I just don't want um, young people nowadays to think of financial services purely in the private sector. Uh, we, uh, another of our outside speakers in this course this semester was Hank Greenberg, who, uh, well, he actually su succeeded C.V. Starr as the founder of the world, was, what was then the world's biggest insurance company, AIG. And one of the things that he told us was that the, how did AIG get so successful? Part of it was because it embraced the emerging world. And uh, even when it wasn't popular to do so, AIG was founded in, I think it was Beijing or Shanghai maybe, uh, mm. a long time ago. Uh, and I thought that uh, maybe he and you have a similar, it, it seems like the emerging world is obviously more and more part of our economy and will continue to continue to be. Um, and that business being connected through the, it, you know, we're getting more and more international, as you were saying. It, it kind of mm -hmm. makes for a different life. And, and one thing that AIG and Hank Greenberg emphasized to us is that he has a life of diplomacy in some sense. He mm -hmm. had to, he became a diplomat or like an ambassador <laughs> from the business community. Because to work with all these different countries requires a certain sense of 
mission and purpose and, and skills. Uh, and and uh, I, I don't know if this is a well-framed question, but it, it seems like what you were saying implies an interesting career involving in the emerging world and a career that involves a broad, a broad scope of skills, not just narrow finance skills. Does that, does that mm -hmm. prompt you? Huh? Yes, <laughs> yes. I, I very much agree with uh, Hank Greenberg's view. I think um, uh, when you work in an emerging market or you work in emerging markets, you develop a different set of skills. And I think in the today's globalized world, um, there are more and more multicultural global professionals. Um, in the, I think you know, we're talking about 20, 30 years ago, uh, U.S. expatriates, for, for that matter, any other, uh, you know, expatriates from the U.K., for example, uh, go out to the emerging market, and people kind of use it as a stint. You work for, you know, five, six years, and you go back to um, your homeland, and uh, and your roots will be in the in your homeland, which is, you know, perfectly fine, and that's what most people do. But I think in the last decade, um, I have seen and I have come across more and more young professionals who, um, uh, because of the education, because of the background, uh, what I would call global professionals, they are multicultural, they are, some of, uh, many of them are multilingual, and they will move job to job in the overseas market. Uh, and people look upon it as uh, life's adventure. Uh, you live in a country for you know five six years and then you move on and the skills that you acquire along the way really enrich yourself, uh, enrich oneself and and eventually if you do go back or not go back to your homeland it will, it is some skill that will stay with you and it change your perspective and I think that kind of skill are becoming increasingly important uh, when we have more and more cross border transactions and globalized market where something happens in one market has an effect, you know, way beyond the borders. And that's what we're seeing more and more nowadays. Uh, I was going to ask the class for questions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, let me just, let me, uh, while you're thinking for a moment, let me ask one more question of you. Sure. Uh, uh, I just wondered about HSBC, which is mm -hmm. uh, an, another bank that origin well, like AIG, it originated in Hong Kong and right. Shanghai, but it has become such a world force. Uh, mm -hmm. And I kind of wonder, when did that happen? Uh, how did that right. happen? Uh, can you give us a nutshell? Sure. Because it doesn't yeah. happen to every <laughs> Asian bank. <laughs> um, HSBC started in Hong Kong. Uh, 1865. Within a few months, the Shanghai office, uh, the Shanghai branch was set up the same year. So we've been here, you know, 160 years or so. Um, originally, it was trading, uh, trading, dealing with trade finance and so on. And it became the largest bank in Hong Kong over many decades. And the international push really started in the early 90s. When the, um, when the HSBC started acquiring uh, different banks. It acquired the Marin Midland Bank in the US, and uh, it acquired the Midland Bank in the UK. And from a, from a bank, from a financial institution which was largely uh, local in Hong Kong with businesses in Asia, it uh, started this international it became an international organization by acquisition. Um, so the head office moved from Hong Kong to London, I think around 92, 93, when the HSBC acquired the Midland Bank in the UK and the Bank of England required uh, the HSBC to have uh, the domicile in London to be regulated by the Bank of England. Since the 90s, the HSBC has acquired one of the largest bank in France called CCF. It's now called HSBC France. Um, it has acquired Bank of Bermuda in Bermuda. 
Uh, and it has made a lot of acquisition. Of course, the most famous or infamous acquisition in the U.S. was household finance um, about uh, 10 year, less than 10 years ago. So in, HSBC became an international financial institution really in the last, I would say, 15 to 20 years. Um, now, today, um, uh, the, our profit... Uh, one third of profit comes from Hong Kong, one third comes from the rest of Asia, 25% or so from UK and Europe. The US, it's uh, well about 6%, and Latin America, about 9%, roughly. So Asia is an import, a hugely important market uh, for HSBC. And the, and the acronym is Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation, which was the original name. Uh, when we were set up in 1865. So it is, um, we do not have a, a, a controlling shareholder. We are truly diversified in our shareholder base. Our largest shareholder holds no more than 3 to 4%. It's an institution investor, so they represent many smaller investors. So it is really run by the management, uh, professional management, and it has done, a, I would have to say, a very good job in the last um, two decades. Okay, any other, any? Um, Allie here. Okay. Hi, thank you for coming. Um, I was just curious, um, a lot of people have mentioned that the lack of regulation and enforcement uh, of contracts is a main barrier to foreign investment in Asian bond markets. Um, how do you think China will address this? Um, and that what are the primary differences in the regulation between China and the United States? Um, can you say, can you say your question again? I didn't catch it. I mean, I only hear the regulation. Can you say that? Can you can you tell me your question again? Um, yes. Many people have mentioned that the lack of regulation and enforcement mm -hmm. of contracts is a main barrier to foreign investment in Asian bond markets. How do you think China mm -hmm. will address this? How do I think what? How will China address this issue? Oh, okay. the lack of um, regulation. Right. I think um, China does not have a lack of regulation. Uh, there are lots of regulation in China. What I would say is that there has to be better application and enforcement of regulations rather than uh, periodic and not consistent regulation. I think one of the most important thing for the market in terms of uh, regulation is that they have to be clear, they have to be consistently applied, and they have to be fair. Uh, it is not a lack of regulation that, um, uh, that, that is the major problem. Uh, I think as in many emerging markets, China is still trying to grope with the issue of uh, stringent enforcement. And I think the regulators in China recognize that there is a lot that they need to, uh, they, they have to do better in terms of enforcement. Uh, and the problem that I see in China is that it is developing so fast, the market is way ahead, um, developing faster and quicker and, and bigger than the, um, the government and the regulator have anticipated. If we put ourselves back um, in the U.S. and let's say in um, the crash of the late 20s and when the SEC was set up in 1934, uh, I would say China is probably slightly better than the U.S. in those days. Uh, but you know, if we compare with the development of the U.S. market in the last five decades or so, uh, of course the U.S. has developed a lot more. And uh, China does not have the luxury to wait 50 years for its rules and enforcement culture to develop. And it is catching up. Uh, whether the lack of regulation is therefore an impediment to foreign investment, I think you'll have to look at it from several angles. Um, China to date is the largest uh, recipient of foreign direct investments. So, you know, in a way, if the conditions in China is so bad, it would not have attracted so much foreign direct investment. I'm not saying that the environment in China is really 
you know, top notch to compare with the developed market. But there probably are enough opportunities and people do make enough money so that it is by statistics the largest recipient of foreign direct investment. And that is, you know, a fact compiled by, you know, international um, agencies. So I don't think that it has been an impediment. It is an impediment when we talk about individual cases, it is far, you know, it's far from satisfactory. <laughs> Could I just interject a question there? Some people say that the SEC in the United States could use much more resources. Does China give enough resources to enforcement? It seems to me that there is a problem in emerging countries where everywhere mm -hmm. that it's expensive. And the country has a budget, right, which is still right. attracted to other things. So do you think that the China devotes enough resources to yeah. enforcement? I think um, every regulator would tell you uh, that uh, they need more resources as far as enforcement is concerned. I think China should cer could, could certainly do with more. Um, I think one aspect uh, is that you have to have enough people to carry out the enforcement. And uh, it is uh, trying to catch up. And as I said, you know, because the market is developing so fast, uh, that the regulators are always trying to play catch up. And uh, that is not ideal. I think the SEC could do with more resources. I would absolutely agree with that. And any, any um, regulators you go to, they, they always felt that uh, the under-resourced aspect is the enforcement. Other questions? Right here. I was wondering if you think that there are any impediments to development in the Chinese or Hong Kong markets based on the government of China. You mentioned earlier that there was a communist tradition um, that a lot of the businesses that you worked with were um, state-oriented or state-owned. So I was wondering if you think that that will have to change in the future or if the market will uh, change or in some way adapt to allow those to continue to operate as they do now. Um, do you mean the state-owned enterprises? Yes. When you, when you say impediment, what do you mean by that? Um, you mentioned that there was uh, a tradition of uh, communism and state-owned enterprises, um, that a lot right. of the busi businesses were a little bit wary of a capitalist system, um, and that you mm -hmm. played a pivotal role in introducing that idea and really implementing it. Do you think that that type of change yeah. will continue? Uh, very much so. I think capitalism has taken deep root in China already. Uh, if you go to China nowadays, the state-owned enterprises very much operate as, um, as any other enterprises. The difference is that the controlling shareholder is the state, is the, is the you know, some sort of government uh, entity. But it operates, if you look at some of the larger um, state-owned enterprises like China Mobile, um, PetroChina, uh, some of these large China Telecom, they are state-owned enterprises, no question, because their majority shareholder, the controlling shareholder is the state. But it operates in a commercial way. Uh, of course, some people will say that there are, um, uh, there are policy you know, uh, uh, preferences, advantages to be a state-owned enterprises. But I think by and large, now, the state-owned enterprises, particularly those that are listed on the exchange, and some of those are listed in the U.S. market as well, they do have to operate in a completely commercial manner. Uh, they have shareholders to answer to other than the state. They have minority shareholders who are public shareholders. And I think that's where the discipline comes in, the market discipline comes in. So um, when you say whether there should be any change, whether any change will take place, change have already taken place and will continue to take place. Is there another? Let me just add something. It occurs to me that, um, at least in the U.S., there has been a policy going back to the 1930s of trying to encourage little startup companies we created the Small mm. Business Administration, which subsidizes. The idea has been that big things grow out of small beginnings. I, I wonder if you could comment on, on China. And it, uh, it mm. Does China support 
young startups uh, right. uh, adequately? Yeah. Uh, it does. Um, it has been now two years since the Growth Enterprise Board had been set up in the Shenzhen Stock Exchange, uh, what we call the GEM Board. And uh, it, uh, it has a lower uh, listing criteria, uh, and that is more or less a buyer's beware market. Um, I mean, it is like any other buyer's aware market. It's, you know, fraught with um, a number of, you know, high profile, high PE companies, which may or may not develop into uh, something more concrete. But I think the idea is to use the capital market to nurture the, um, the small business. Um, that's the growth enterprise market. Some Gen Stock Exchange, which is across the border from Hong Kong, also have a part of its board. It's called Small Medium Enterprise Board. So if you are not a growth company, but you are a small and medium sized company, then you are listed on this other board. Uh, so there are two specific boards addressing exactly what you, um, the question you raised, to, namely to nurture uh, the smaller companies. Hey, uh, could you give um, a couple examples maybe of like the skills you learned in the public sector that um, helped you now working at HSBC? Um, or maybe like a situation where, uh, because of what you learned in the public sector, you had uh, right. better decision making? Um, that's a good question. I think what I uh, took away most from my um, years as a regulator is really to look at the, look at an issue from a macro level. Um, I think in a private sector, when you are given a problem, when you are, let's say, in a private firm, in a bank or, you know, a law firm or um, any professional firm, you're given a set of um, problems. Perhaps, you know, a, a client has a certain problem and your, your role is to help solve that problem. And the context of that client alone and that problem in, its, um, in the confine of that problem. And most of the time, you help the client to um, you will help the client to overcome uh, some either legal issues or other you know commercial issues, so that the client can get to where he wants to go, whether you know it's acquisition or merger or disposal, etc. In the private sector, in the public sector, as a regulator, you learn to look at the issue that is presented to you from a more macro level in the sense that how does this particular issue impact on the market as a whole? I'll give you an example. Um, a group of company, uh, a group of companies in Hong Kong came to the regulator in Hong Kong and asked for certain exemptions. The reason that they put forward are quite cogent um, and not unreasonable from the client's point of view, from the company's point of view. Now, as if I were in my role as a lawyer, I would fight very hard for the client to get that exemption. But as a regulator, then I have to look, what does this, um, what does the, if I give the exemption, what kind of knock-on effect will it have? What kind of precedent, it, it will set a precedent, and is it a good precedent or is it not a good precedent? If it is a good precedent, then it should not be just given to this one particular company. Then there should be, perhaps the rule should be amended in such a way that what this client, what this particular group of company wants should be um, given to everyone who wants to apply for it. Uh, but if it is not, and if it is just purely for the benefit of this one particular group of company, then you know, you really should not uh, give it to give in to that exemption. And you have, do have to recognize that um, there are different considerations, such as the size of the group, the impact that it may have on the market, uh, etc. So the skill that one learns as a regulator is really to look at the, the problem presented to you from a more, um, from, an, from an over, you know, you can, uh, at a higher level, you look at the entire um, scenario and how the 
how this piece will fit into a bigger picture where in the private sector you don't need to. And how it's helpful to me now in my current position is that I am able, I think, um, to interpret policy and um, to anticipate policy because I could see that you know certain things are happening a certain way that as a regulator, those are the issues that the regulators are likely to address and therefore, you know, from the private sector, we should be prepared for the changes that will uh, take place. So that's in a very abstract way. I can't quote you exact examples for obvious reasons, but um, that is in a nutshell. Uh, I certainly find that help me as a person to look at um, matters from a more um, broad, from a broader from a broader point of view. Hi, thank you. Uh, you spoke about the demutualization of uh, stock exchanges, and one of the outcomes we've seen of that is uh, the mergers and acquisitions of stock exchanges themselves. And I think in the last one year itself, we've seen a whole bunch of uh, very interesting deals, Singapore, Australia, New York, Deutsche, et cetera. And one of the ones that really caught my attention was the Shanghai-Brazil link-up. Um, so perhaps I want to hear your views on, uh, do you think this wave of of tie-ups is going to carry on? And if so, what form do you think it will take in the coming years? I think um, in the last um, decade, the exchanges around the world has really taken on, um, or more than, more, more than a decade now, um, the, the landscape has completely changed. It used to be an exchange is kind of like a national symbol. Uh, each nation has its own exchange and that is almost like a national um how should i say it's a utility that you know cannot be be taken over by uh, other by by uh, a foreign country we saw that uh when by the wayside when the new york stock exchange um acquired a euronext and um and of course um uh nasdaq uh, alliances and just different ways and now we are into a second phase where these already consolidated and aligned um, exchanges are forming even more um, consolidation. That, that may or may not happen. There's a lot of talk about it. And I think what drives this latest wave of exchange, um, uh, how should I say, the um, acquisitions and alliances are really the, um, the ECN, the electronic um, network, that are driving the cost of trading down, um, that uh, that leave the larger exchange like the NYSE, a lot of the volume has gone to the ECN and they really have to align with others to get the business up. The other is uh, products. I think the line, uh, the, the, the merger of exchanges would only make sense when the two pro they are mutually complementary products. Um, and geography of also makes sense. Um, and how will I see the outcome? I think many markets still look upon their, uh, how should I say, their exchange as a national symbol and they do not necessarily want. It's more a, a matter of the local politician's sentiment rather than looking at the commercial side and look at the political side. Someone once told me, you know, this uh, Singapore and Australian stock exchange, uh, uh, the pending merger that has been announced. I, I don't have the latest. I don't know whether it's going to go through. Uh, somebody in Australia told me, well, it is almost like Qantas being taken over by Singapore Airlines. Um, in the commercial world, well, if that makes sense, why not? But I think there is still a lot of sentiment towards stock exchange that is something very national. So I don't know how that will play out because all these mergers are subject to the votes of the local politicians. And so they may have different consideration than just purely the commercial side. Hello. Hi. Um, thank you for your time. I have sort of a two part questions. Um, the mm -hmm. first part is, in, I mean, in regards to all these Chinese companies that are registered overseas, 
Um, mm -hmm. You know, that sort of a complex case of regulation. So I was wondering if you could talk about how like all a lot of Chinese companies being registered overseas and being listed in overseas exchanges. Mm -hmm. And second part of the question is, I've heard, at least I've read, that there is a new international board that's being set up in China to encourage these companies to com come back to mainland China or Hong Kong. So I was wondering if you could mm -hmm. talk a little bit about like how it's going to be shaped, right. um, some of its challenges, and what, and what do you think mm -hmm. would be most important for its success? Right. Okay. Um, the first part of your question, Chinese companies that are registered overseas and listed overseas, um, there is no rule that forbid Chinese company to be registered anywhere. Um, I think, you know, uh, let's say a company in China, they can elect to register themselves in Hong Kong, in Bermuda, Cayman Island, wherever, U.S., Delaware. Um, and the matter of listing is really up to um, the issuer itself, you know, they, if they decided that a listing in the U.S., whether it's NASDAQ or the NYSE, it makes sense, that's where they will list. And once they are listed, they are subject to the rules and regulations of the SEC, just like anybody else, just like any of the other foreign companies. Uh, so I think um, uh, the place of listing really determine the kind of rules that will be applied to that company. Once a company is listed, uh, let's say uh, on the New York Stock Exchange, then the U.S. rules will come in, and whether it is a Chinese company, then it kind of um, it's kind of irrelevant. It will have to be complying with the U.S. rules, just like everybody else. So that's the first part of your question. I don't know whether that's that answer it. Um, the second part of your question about international board in Shanghai. Yes, there has been a lot of talk about the Shanghai Stock Exchange setting up an international board, uh, meaning that a board where um, companies registered outside of China, such as the red chips, which are not listed in China, will return to the Shanghai Stock Exchange. Because they are not registered in China, they are therefore not a Chinese company. They are therefore kind of like a foreign company because they registered in Hong Kong or Bermuda or wherever. Um, the idea of the international board is to attract not only these types of Chinese companies that have been registered outside, but companies that are multinationals that, um, that are already listed in the outside market to be inside China. And a major reason um, that I can, that I can uh, 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 discern is one, to give the Chinese investor a wider variety of products. Because the renminbi is still a non-convertible currency, the vast majority of Chinese investors can only invest in the domestic market, only in the Chinese companies that are listed there. They are not easily, they cannot easily invest in, let's say, Microsoft, HSBC, IBM, General Motor, etc. So, you know, I think the Chinese government is thought, well, maybe we can bring some of the companies to China uh, for these companies to raise capital and issue shares in China so that the Chinese investors will be able to assess it. Uh, the second part is really to raise the profile and the uh, standard of the Shanghai Stock Exchange. Um, the Shanghai Stock Exchange has ambition to be an international financial center. Um, and, and a domestic document have said that it should be developed into an international financial center by the year 2020. And one of the roots of reaching that goal is to have an international board for international companies. And that um, is what I think the Shanghai government and the Shanghai Stock Exchange are setting out to do. But to date, the rules are, have not yet been promulgated. Uh, we don't know when it will. Um, I was a, a delegate to the National People's Congress, and we met in March, uh, I mean, earlier this month, and there's no discussion or timetable that has been set. Uh, many people think it will be a good thing. Some people inside China think that it will not be such a good thing because it will divert the um, the savings to foreign companies, but I think most people think that it will be a good thing for China. Um, so I don't know whether 
that answer your question. Do you have a second part to the second question? I might have missed it. No, I think that really answered my question. But the first part, actually, the reason why I asked the first part of the uh -huh. question was because a lot of, at least, like a lot of the uh, recent sort of the frauds that came up happened mm -hmm. or were discovered because a lot of Chinese companies were registered in the New York Stock Exchange had a filing with the CAC, whereas they also have a filing for their own government, the Chinese government, and then these these filings for their like annual reports or like their numbers would not match. And mm. I, I just thought there would be some kind of like, complications in terms of regulation when you when the government is regulating these companies. <laughs> I think um, I, I I think that you know whenever a company is listed on a foreign market, it is subject to the to the full rules and regulation of that market. Um, there's no ifs and buts. I think the you know the U.S. authority would take action. Uh, against any fraudulent or, you know, misstatement. Okay, right here. What type of law did you study and how did you, how difficult did you find the transition from the legal world to the business world? Um, I, I studied most most of the well. I think in law school, I you know took a lot of courses in corporate law, tax, um, uh, corporate finance. Uh, I think the business will always interest me. Uh, the transition from law to, I, I think I did. Um, it was a two step thing. I was a lawyer, and then I was a regulator, and then I was completely in the private sector now. Um, so the transition from a lawyer to a regulator wasn't that difficult. Uh, I remember distinctly that when I moved over to the to the Securities and Futures Commission, uh, what I wasn't used to is I, I always want to correct every document that came before me. I want to improve it. I mean, it was just the lawyer in me. I want to make it, um, you know, could be written better, clearer, etc. Then I have to kind of restrain myself uh, to really, I wasn't there to correct and make the uh, issue, I mean, to make the a presentable document, but to really solve the problems. Um, and then having been a regulator and mostly really regulating the corporate world, I became quite familiar with all the, with the corporate finance side. Uh, and when I was at the Securities and Futures Commission in Hong Kong, I was the head of the corporate finance division for five years. And during that five years, I, I came across all kinds of corporate transactions. Uh, merger acquisition takeovers and you know of course the IPOs so that kind of um, helped me in where I am today you know it's a I, I wouldn't really call me a banker per se because I'm not in the operation side I'm on the board and then I provide advisory um, a, a advisory service to to uh, HSBC uh, but I'm not really operating as a banker per se so I would say it wasn't difficult. It was an evolution type of, you know, throughout my career from one thing to the next. Okay. Pass the microphone. Hi. Uh, I was wondering, having worked um, on the regulation side and now working for the private sector, I think that's puts you in a unique position to determine what the impact of internationalization of regulation will have on the financial services sector. So in, you know, more specifically, what do you think the regulatory impact of Basel III will be? Um, because a lot of private sector individuals have come out and said that some of the requirements in terms of the capital adequacy requirements and so on are, have been very harsh. Right. Um, yeah. So first of all, I guess, how do you think it will be phased in? And second of all, do you think that it's the appropriate level of regulation? Um, Basel III, I think it is very costly to implement. I think the banks uh, have largely accepted that you know string, more stringent regulation will have to come our way because of the financial crisis of the last two years. Um, but not all banks are alike, and certainly at HSBC, we felt that we have been thrown in with the rest of them, and whereas we had not taken any government money and we have um, done reasonably well. We have weathered the crisis reasonably well. But having said that, 
uh, I think one has to accept that whenever there's a the crisis, regulation will come in more stringently, and the pendulum will tend to swing too far one way. And then gradually, the pendulum will come in the, you know, in the bull market, the, ben, the, uh, the pendulum will swing back, and then it will be too lax. And then the, another crisis will happen, and then more rules will come in. It has always been like that. If you look at um, the history of any market, uh, they always swung uh, to the extreme. Sabang Oxley, I think, is a good example. Um, Something obviously came about, I don't need to tell you, as a result of the Enron crisis. And of course, the last crisis, which was the subprime crisis, was nothing like Enron. So, you know, the regulators, we, when I was a regulator, we always say we are always correcting yesterday's problems. You know, when a scandal happened, when a crisis happened, we think of rules to address what had gone wrong. But the next time when something happened, it's not going to happen the same way. You are preventing just the old problem from repeating itself, but the new problem will be entirely different. So that's just you know the way things are. Uh, and that's the, the other reason why I think some of the young and bright students should not always be in the private sector. The public sector needs a balance of that. And then as far as international regulations are concerned, the regulators have talked for a long time about harmonization of standards. I don't think it will happen because Different regulators, different national uh, regulators have their own priorities, and they don't always um, have the same priorities. And the best example is really the Financial Stability Board, which came out of the, um, the last the Asian financial crisis. It was called Financial Stability Forum. It is now a Financial Stability Board. And the idea is to ensure that there's financial stability globally, but that takes a lot of work. I think the G20 is uh, trying very hard, and, and of course, you know, the, the, the regulatory agencies as well as all the central bankers are now hopefully more in a more, um, in a better cooperative mood. But I think to have one set of international and harmonized standards is very hard. Okay, I think we're out of time. Uh, Laura, I just want to thank you. Uh, I think this was very good. Uh, I, hearing the details of your career and hearing all the different things you've done in both the public and private sector um, reminds me of uh, we're going through a period of development of the world and expansion, and somebody has to get the details right. <laughs> and, and I'm very impressed that you are one of those people who's making things work. So I'm glad that you were able to convey these thoughts to our students here today, and thank you very much.